Yeah, my slides are visible. Slides, uh, I had seen. Yeah, yeah, it is visible. Okay, okay, yes. sir. See, last time there's some issues. So, shall we start? Actually, what Rohit was telling that uh, okay. you please share your full screen. Uh, right now, it's full screen only. Uh, okay. So, if full screen is shared, then uh, there should not be much problem. That is what okay, he was okay, okay. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. So, okay, okay, no issues. So, before I so before hand over uh, this show I to Dr. Kunal Sarmaji for Dr. today's uh, lecture, I thought I would uh, share one or two things with all the participants. So, dear friends, good afternoon. And I, I welcome you all uh, in this 11th lecture of our design system management course. And uh, as you already know, the lecture is to be delivered by Dr. Kunal Sarmaji on uh, industrial and chemical disaster management. And uh, in fact, I have requested him to uh, deliver the next lecture schedule on 10th of uh, November also in the same series. So before I hand over this, I thought uh, that now we are on the 11th uh, lecture. That is uh, stage one's one third. One third we have uh, discussed so far. Two third is going to be discussed over next uh, one and a half months time. Uh, it was just a thought in my mind that uh, the participants, if they keep sharing their uh, thoughts, some ideas, some feedback, or some small questions, it will be really quite uh, interesting and encouraging. So if you like the idea, please uh, do so. Because uh, we also are learning, you can see, uh, definitely I can say about me that I am also learning in this entire exercise. So your uh, question answers, your comments or your feedback uh, are highly welcome. And uh, that will be a shot in the right direction, I suppose. So I wish you all very, very happy festivals. Happy Diwali. And I now request Dr. Konal Sarmaji to continue with the 11th lecture, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, good afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Kunal Sharma, and uh, we were earlier discussing industrial chemical disaster management, wherein we have some scenario. We have seen some scenarios of uh, uh, Bhopal gas disaster and uh, some other case studies where we have seen the impact of chemical disaster in the industries on the community on the another part also so now we will in this lecture we will try to discuss some technical inputs which is quite related to chemical to understand the nature the property of chemicals that how they uh, become so uh, vulnerable when we use chemicals on bulk scale so with that i am starting my session today so uh, today i want to tell something about the intentional inten uh, intentional chemical disasters so if we talk about the definition part it is an intentional intentional release or spill of a toxic chemical that results in an abrupt and uh, serious disruptions of the functioning of a society causing widespread human material environmental losses that exceed the ability of affected society to cope when using only its own resources Sir, voice is this not definition would include the i think it's so, yeah, am I audible? Yeah, somebody's mic is open. Rajesh B. Paul. Please, please mute your mic, please. Mr. Rajesh, please. Sorry. So, uh, I was talking about the intentional chemical disaster. So, as I have discussed, the important term in this thing that uh, every society has certain type of resources to cope up with any situation 
But when we talk about the industrial intentional chemical disaster and quite related to disasters, which is relating the chemical, it will cause an impact on the society, human, material, environmental losses that exceed the ability of affected society to cope. Affected society could be anyone, could be a company, could be a district, could be a tehsil place, could be a country. So it is very much important to understand what is intentional and what is not unintentional because we know the chemicals like chlorine, phosgene, organophosphates, all are there. They are helping the human uh, being in many ways. But when they are used as an intentional chemical thing, then it becomes problem for us. And this include results will be for chemical warfare, chemical terrorism and industrial sabotage. When we go for the chemical warfare agents, we will in depth and try to understand chemical warfare and chemical terrorism. But here we are focusing on the industrial chemical disasters. That means the chemicals being used, these chemicals being used intentionally for any chemical emergencies or disasters. To cope up is very much required. If we have enough anti roads, if, if we have enough PPEs or medical facilities or mitigation strategies, then it is uh, on our own, uh, own thing that how to uh, cope up with the situation or how to make uh, bring back the situation on the normal node. So it is very much important to use this word each and every time. For example, there is a chemical leak, leak of 100 say, ton of chemicals, and we have the preparedness of around 1000 tons so it is not being going to impact us or yes people will be affected but we will uh, come back to the uh, natural uh, uh, this thing after utilizing the mitigation strategies so when we talk about the important terms generally chemicals can be of uh, various natures but when the chemicals are toxic then it is very very much important for people like us to understand and thought what it could be uh, what how it could be, uh, create a problem so chemicals may be encountered as reactants, solvents, catalysts, inhibitors, or starting materials, finished products, byproducts, contaminants, or of specification products. Depending on the property, depending on the nature, there are n number of classification of chemicals. As I already quoted you, there are more more than seven lakhs chemicals present, and it is growing day by day. But yes, each and every chemical has different property and different role. Just giving you example of a system that if we are working in a company, then there is a, you know, and the company is manufacturing something, but there are roles of the sales officials also, there is a role of HR also, there is a role of management also, there is a role of workers also. Similarly, in case of chemicals also, they could be reactant, solvent, catalyst, inhibitors, as you starting materials, we put anything. So they may vary from pure single substances to complex proprietary formulations. It depends how it is being utilized how it will be used it all depends on the properties of the chemicals next exposures to chemicals may involve solids liquids or airborne matters such as mist aerosols dust fumes micro sized particulates vapors or gases in any combination so because as we all know right now the condition of environment is very much degrading and we see the uh, encountering of all this uh, pollution it is basically a combination of all these materials, mist, aerosols, dust fumes. It could be anything. It could be a combination of various gases also, what we call as exposure from the paralysis, exposure from the two, two vehicles, exposure from BS2, BS6 type of um, uh, vehicles also. So it could be anything and it, it basically uh, converts into a dangerous or toxic uh, uh, this thing. Many situations, example, exposure to welding fumes or to combustion products from fossil fuels include mixture both of chemicals and of physical forms in that case quantification of exposure is very difficult for example if we are not able to understand welding fumes plus combustion product why uh, it could be a, a big problem when we mix one or two or three materials in one go we had prepared for a particular thing and uh, as per the msds or as per the property of the chemical it should it, it, it has to show a particular variation but when it got mixed and it, it is a mixture then the variation is quite large it could affect your eyes also it could affect your respiration system also it can be carcinogen also everything is there so quantification is a little bit, uh, tough for any any researcher any lab people to do or quantify what type of exposure it is an exposure to a specific chemical is relatively low concentrations over a period may result in chronic effect I was earlier discussing you about some diseases also. For example, there are around 29 notifiable diseases. Uh, I will discuss it also in the later uh, slide. But notifiable diseases are those diseases 
uh, that is uh, once this disease is caught it is very very impossible very tough to to get rid of these diseases this is called notifiable disease in india right now we have 29 uh, odd notifiable disease enlisted by the government of india at uh, so that is why it will not affect in a, in a instantaneously but it will become chronic after uh, exposure for a longer period at high concentrations the effect may be acute obviously it is going to be acute if concentration is too much some chemicals produce local damage at their point of contact with or entry into the body other product produce systematic effects that is are transported within the body to various organs before exerting an adverse effect so these are this is the issues with chemicals also that means they are transported within the body to various organs before exerting any adverse effect for example if they have reached the lungs part and that it started showing the real property of the chemical it is a big threat to any any uh, worker any uh, person who is exposed with the chemical so these all things are very much required for the uh, for understanding the impact or the effect of chemicals on the community because as we are going increasing on the cbr course we have to understand some technical parts also yes we are first responders most of us are first responders or responders we are not going for the technical part but we have to understand little bit properties of chemicals biological agents also radioactive nuclear so in the chemicals the, the biggest issue is that they then the systematic effect which 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 is very clearly defining it enters the body and it is not showing the uh, the real nature of uh, its defined uh, in intensity in this case we have to go for the hazard recognition because we are talking about toxic chemicals the toxic the toxicity of a substance is its capacity to cause injury once inside the body it is very clear that we have to focus upon this for toxicity how toxic a material is if it is up to a permeable limit that means we have the mitigation strategies we have the sources then it's okay so we have to focus on this part that uh, uh, the, what, how to capacity to injure um, inside the body it is not that it will uh, impact uh, uh, to, to to a longer period but yes when in when, when it gets inside your body what it what type of damage it is going to do the main modes of entry we have already discussed there are four main modes of in, uh, uh, entry of any chemicals in the body that is inhalation ingestion absorption and one more part is ingestion ingestion you know very well anything which go from the mouth inhale you are inhaling or taking something from uh, your nose and absorption on the skin part which is injection is another part which we have encountered in certain chem industries we are uh, we have uh, doing some audit in any automobile industry where we have see, we have seen that uh, uh, industry, auto industry was using robotic arms robotic arms have things the robotic arms was having some outer area so generally the workers going inside they told that the entire is this area and robots is moving around this diameter Whenever a worker or a people uh, goes inside the industry, it uh, comes in the context of the cut injury. Cut injury was prevalent in that uh, uh, particular industry because it was a automobile industry and robotic arms were used. When the patients goes to the doctor and when we go, when we did their medical checkup, we have found that uh, along with the cut injury, some workers were complaining of the exposure of chemicals also. Means in the blood, we got samples of certain chemicals which should not be there as it was an automobile industry. After a few days after the study and investigation, we come to know that that all the blades of say this robotic arms was having certain deposition of chemicals. There nearby there was a chemical industry which is using toxic chemicals, and with the help of I don't know, it is very not not very clear to us, but study to, uh, to tells us that these all robotic arms got a layer of these chemicals after a period of six months of one year and get deposited on the outer outer area whenever the workers pass through this area his hand or legs they got cut so they they were not facing the problem cut part but yes the chemical is going to be being injected in, in into the body of the workers unintentionally they don't know they thought it's a cut injury we will take simple medicine we will be fine but after 15 days 20 days the cut was not okay then the doctors say we have to go for much more tests so this is the issues which we have seen in or encountered in the industry one industry which is being manufacturing a automobile a part of thing and another nearby factory which is using a chemical so due to dispersion or any other mode of transfer these chemicals deposited and it entered the workers so this could be for the community also that communities are using something there is a nearby leakage there may be little spillage there may be a small leak but yes it got deposited some on some other material which indirectly caused problem to all these things so these are the issues which we see the modes are inhalation ingestion absorption and injection 
is the basic uh, mode of entry gases vapors mist dust fumes and aerosols can be inhaled they can also affect the skin eyes and mucous membranes so all this uh, enter our body ingestion is rare although possible because why i am telling you the personal hygiene of people or workers some conscious hand to mouth contact and accidents generally we, when you go in big industries or major accidental hazard units you will see there are 1000 to 3000 workers working over there and they are handling some four or five hazardous chemicals listed in schedule 2 of msic rules 1989 so these chemicals are not very much in the atmosphere but yes some part of these are there workers eating open or maybe the industries just giving you an example of sulfuric acid if you have a you are working in a lead battery lead battery uh, lead battery plant you will see the utilization of sulfuric acid to a very big extent though sulfuric acid is very much pertinent in that particular area what happened whenever the workers work in that area you know the culture of our country that workers sit in open together during the lunch break time and they eat together so the deposition of these sulfuric acid is very pertinent and when they eat with their <coughs> the food it goes inside the body and nobody even knows how this chemical entered just giving example because in lead battery case it is uh, very much there uh, the, the 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 composition of sulfuric acid and uh, similar type of toxic chemicals the skin can be affected directly by contact with the chemicals when even when intact but its permeability to certain substance also offers a route into the body chemical accorded a skin not notation in the list of occupational occupation exposure limits exposure may also arise via skin lesson so in general if we talk all this mode inhal inhalation ingestion absorption ingestion anything can be the cause of uh, uh, say exposure of chemical and it can enhance the toxicity of the particular chemical to the workers maybe through known route maybe through unknown route for example inhale you can understand but ingestion absorption absorption most of the workers most of the people don't know they they are the, uh, absorbing toxic chemicals inside their body just like example of any gel or ointment you use in case of pain on your outer layer and you will feel that okay the pain will be reduced why because the skin we, we, we get absorbed inside the body similar case of chemicals it will not uh, show its particular properties immediately but after a few days after the exposure after a long period of time it will show okay slowly slowly it has been deposited in the blood and we the, the person the worker or the <clears throat> any uh, this thing related to industry being affected by the uh, toxic chemicals now we will go for some classification of airborne contaminants. It is much required because in any industry it is very very pertinent, and there are certain groups. And I have tried to put in this type of thing classification subgroups and examples. So start with the irritants. It is a terminology what we call irritant. It have a corrosive or a vesicant, blistering effect or moist or mucous surface. Concentration may be more important than duration of exposure. Animals and men react similarly. In this case, if we talk about the irritant type of thing, it is it shows immediate effect on the body. Immediate effect to the body. It will form blister on the bodies of the worker, blister in the body of the animals. It will not show. It will not uh, tolerate anything. So when we go for the warfare part of also, even uh, when misuse is there or uh, intentionally is there, then also big problem comes into the uh, this thing. So when we talk about the uh, classification part, it is basically primary A and uh, the subgroups in this is upper respiratory, upper and lower respiratory, lower respiratory skin. This means all these para tracks are being exposed or affected due to the irritant properties. Example could be vapor, gas, mist. If you talk about the major part, it could be phosgene, nitrogen dioxide, arsenic, trichloride. The, I am trying to, uh, to, 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 to deliver some known chemicals which you are uh, using or you are knowing because it is not easy for everybody to understand scl is there but you can correlate from this thing formaldehyde <coughs> these terminologies are quite known to you organic acids sodium hydroxide naoa sodium carbonate all this comes into this particular irritant classification only and examples of irritants are this if this material directly comes in contact with our body or we are exposed it will <clears throat> we get a big problem on our, on our upper sphere. Dust is also examples and detergents like salts, nickel, sulfate, zinc chloride, acids, alkali chromates are also the example of primary irritant which generally focuses on the 
upper respiratory, upper and lower respiratory, skin. These are the classification and you should correlate all this track. For example, acrolein, sulfur dioxide, hydrogen chloride, chromic and formaldehyde focus upon the upper respiratory, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, ozone, cyanogen chloride attacks on the upper and lower respiratory. Lower respiratory we talk about phosgene, nitrogen dioxide, arsenic trichloride. Phosgene again, it will come into the chemical warfare uh, part also, but yes, it is being used in industrial testing. So all this will affect on the lower respiratory tract of any human being and inorganic acids, organic acids, inorganic alkalis like sodium hydroxide, etc. Dust detergent will affect on the skin. And you you all know that all these chemicals have been used also in household, but for example, dust detergents is very common. It's also there. So these will affect the skin of any in particular uh, uh, human being. Talking about the secondary or allergens, here also we have tried to uh, distinguish. For example, we have examples like epoxy, picryl chloride, phenyldiamine. It is skin sensitization. That means it will it will uh, it will be it will bring allergy on the skin, and it is basically focusing on the skin part. So it will now go for the respiratory type or lower respiratory, but it is focusing. These chemicals are focusing on the skin, and it is very uh, risky for the skin part. Second will be the isocyanide group. This group complex also platinum just going to example part we are not going in because again there are n number of chemicals but for a general thought process which are the thing secondary classification in case of irritants these particular chemicals will become sensitive uh, respiratory sensitizers and it, it will affect the respiratory type of any human being now the second uh, classification is sygn ends again it's a very very uh, tough thing it's exert an effect by interference with oxidation of tissue. It directly focuses on the tissue part and it uh, uh, brings problem on the tissues of uh, <clears throat> human being as well as animals also. Talking about general which you all have heard about the chemicals, it is carbon dioxide, methane, hydrogen, nitrogen. It will cause simple anoxia caused by oxygen deficiency inhaled in the air. What aspergents do? It basically cut off the level of oxygen. It will downgrade the level of, we require 21% of oxygen. Uh, in the ambient uh, atmosphere to, to, to breathe properly, to maintain our uh, <coughs> daily distinct. So, all this classification will focus on. If it's understood as a layman, it will basically go for the cutoff of the oxygen or it will down the oxygen and enhance certain other properties which will fall in this uh, particular track. This uh, uh, SYZ. Second category is carbon monoxide, cyanogen, hydrogen cyanide, nitrites, arsine, aniline and all this <laughs> hydrogen sulfide causes respiratory paralysis by impairment of oxygen, oxygen regulation in the central nervous system. It will what it will do? Toxic anoxia caused by damage to the body's oxygen transport or utilization by adverse reaction of biological active agents. Here also the issue is that basically what they are doing, this particular chemical if entering the body, it will stop the proper flow of oxygen or lower the concentration of oxygen which we required in our daily distinct. Next is anesthetics or narcotics. It exerts principal effects as simple anesthesia by depressant action on the central nervous system. Again, you will ask why I am quoting all this thing because all these are categories of classification of chemicals, which is very commonly available in our industries. And we are uh, nearby the industries only. We decide by the industry and we are a big cluster. So if you know about all the things we have heard about acetylene, ether, paraffins, all this will come in this thing and it will what it will do it will act as a depressant action same as the doctors do during the operation they will use it at anesthetic or narcotic it will depress the central nervous system the examples will be acetylene olefins ether esters next is systemic poisons substance that cause injury at other than the site of contact substance which cause injury at other than the site of contact. The, in this case also we have heard about all these names benzene, phenols, some hydrocarbons, carbon sulfide like methanol, phenol. We have heard organophosphorus like insecticides or pesticides are there. These all come this. What they do? They will blood forming system. They will take on the blood form system along with the nervous system. It is basically visceral organs in general hematopoietic. This is very much required that what systemic, systemic poisons do, they will cause injury other than the site of contact. Next, again, respiratory fibrogens. It is again a terminology which is very much important. 
it is basically dust or crystalline silica for example quartz tridymite as well as toes, which is right now banned or talcum talc type of this thing all these things are there which will come into the category of respiratory fibrogens it what it does it basically being converted into silicosis or as <clears throat> fibrosis or asbestosis type of disease for example if silica is entered in our body up to uh, up to uh, more than the saturation level then it basically cause issues in our body this is con comes to the category of respiratory fibrogens then carcinogens very common terminology which you know very well but when we think about the chemical part yes there are certain chemicals because which which directly cause cancer in our body so i have written here skin respiratory bladder liver nasal bone marrow so all these will be impacted by cancer producing agents which will be which is present in certain chemicals for example coal tar pitch dust crude anthracene dust mineral oil arsenic these are the chemicals that can cause cancer and what will be the cancer it will be skin cancer similarly asbestos polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons nickel ore arsenic mustard gas ether all these will impact and will cause cancer in the respiratory tract b naphthalene benzodiazepine and aminophenyl amine these will cause bladder or urinary tract cancer vinyl chloride monomer it will cause liver cancer mustard gas nickel or nasal cancer and benzyl will cause bone marrow cancer so only for the example point i am quoting here in depth we you want to learn you can learn but yes the problem comes where whenever these chemicals are being used for a larger period it is not like that only small acute exposure will uh, convert this particular chemicals to a cancer producing agent or it will cause cancer to the human being it's not like that it will take time but regular use of this chemicals regular uh, this type of chemicals will ultimately cause uh, this thing then we have some what we call inerts and uh, when we go for the chemistry part we have seen in this helium neon argon all these things are uh, basically uh, inert gases and uh, basically they are simple as far as the ends that means they will cut off the amount of oxygen required to inhale to breathe properly in the ambient atmosphere so you if you see this figure also you can see here also that this classification this blue color consists of the inert gases which include helium neon krypton xenon and radon so argon methon hydrogen nitrogen helium and particular example cement calcium carbonate etc come into this category and they form the mixture of this particular thing now we have seen certain toxic toxic chemicals we have seen the effects they, they could be carcinogen they could be asphyxiants they could be irritants what actually they does what actually they does in our body and why we are focusing and taking it as an industrial chemical uh, accident see when we talk about the bhopal gas disaster also we have seen that mic was there methyl isocyanate was there so people told this happened that happened but if you go in the study path and if you uh, uh, analyze the situation you will say <clears throat> those who do run fast okay or those who try to escape from the route they died quickly why they have they have tried to run from this their places and the what happened had we had started pumping very fastly taking to uh, it try to consume more and more oxygen to get energy and uh, this thing during the respiration pro uh, the process what happened when people started to inhale more try to to, uh, to gain more and more oxygen they have consuming more and more methyl isocyanate in what happened when they consumed more and more material it got inside their body and they died quite quite soon in comparison to those who are sitting ideally at a place and have waited so the study shows that okay the time was very much important how much amount they have taken so the effect of toxic chemical should be very known very clearly known because when we talk about any particular industrial sector or pocket we know that how many chemicals are being used and uh, how many chemicals are there in that particular zone or region we are not talking about the chemical warfare part if somebody has attacked somebody has unintentionally or intentionally used this chemical but for the normal context of the chemicals whichever we are using and we know they are toxic it could be easily mitigated because we know the proper sops or antidotes or say mitigation strategies of these things but yes what are the effects it should be known if we know the effects okay if we are going in the open air we could easily be uh, we will be safe and or if we are going inside a confined space we are safe these are things we should be very much known if the basic sops general sops are known then it could be easy for us to mitigate the situation so it is very much important to know the effects of chemical so what are the effects of chemical constrictions of the small vessels in the affected area dilation of the blood vessels increased permeability of the vessel walls and migration of the white blood and offer other defensive cells to the invading harmful chemicals so if you talk about major 
constriction of small vessel, dilation, permeability, and migration of white blood is the basic thing <coughs> which uh, which happens in the when, when somebody is exposed to the toxic chemicals. The main target is the respiratory system for vapor, gas, and mist. So it, if you talk about the categorized pass for vapor, gas, and mist, they will directly focus upon the respiratory system. Just like the, the, the pollution, when we see in the air pollution, what happened? People will start to complain about the choking, they will sneezing, they will start coughing, all these things. So these chemicals in the form of vapor or gas or mist will directly target the respiratory system first. Then it will, parallelly, it will absorb in the body, it's okay. But yes, first is the respiratory system. If we are able to use some PP or go to that place where we can protect our respiratory system, we could 60-70% stop the effect of chemical immediately. Next is the readily, be, readily soluble chemicals, example, chlorine, phosgene, attack the upper respiratory tract. Less soluble gases, example, oxides of nitrogen penetrate more deeply into the conducting airways and in some cases may cause pulmonary edema often after a time delay. So if you think, talk about the medical part also, you can see nitrogens are there, then they will directly go for the airways and uh, in the longer term, it will cause pulmonary edema often time delay. For example, I have written over here, sulfur dioxide is highly water soluble and tends to be absorbed in the airway above the lungs. However, in the presence of particulate catalyst in sunlight, conversion of sulfur trioxide occurs and the retained response is much more severe. So the only property of sulfur trioxide is no issue. Sulfur trioxide is there, it's okay. But if it has conversion, then it is very um, difficult because catalyst is there. Catalyst will speed up the rate of conversion, and yes, sunlight is again is a source to in enhance the quality of this particular uh, chemical. So it is also required that if we are able to stop this particular catalyst, catalyst, or we can stop the sunlight, then the reaction can be stopped or can be slowed down, and which ultimately <clears throat> can help us in few things. Other Parts of the body are uh, also more vulnerable, like the skin and eyes, from direct contact, rubbing, or from exposure to airborne material, including splashes, the mouth, pharynx by ingestion of solids or liquid chemicals. One effect of direct contact of liquid or solid and less often vapor with the skin is contact irritant dermatitis. It is a very common cause in industries when we saw that the particular vapor is directly contacting the worker. See, we cannot uh, understand the situation. Uh, if we are not working any manufacturing or MH unit, what happened in MH units? We the workers are directly directly um, in contact with the chemical part, so they know very well that how it is going to uh, take place, and uh, they understood the issues related to this because they are directly exposing to <coughs> all these things. But yes, people like us will not regularly be focus on this part. Even chemically inert gases, as we have seen, seen example, uh, glass uh, from, from glass fibers can induce a dermatitis due to abrasion. This is made worse in a reactive chemical example. Synthetic resin binder is also involved. Examples of primary irritants include acids, alkalis, diverting compounds, example, organic solvents, surfactants, dehydrating agents, oxidizing agents, and reducing agents occur, and in irritant response is much more severe. So go for the example part also, but it is not too in depth we have to understand. But yes. Whatever chemicals which we think is nearby our industrial area or uh, say in due to transportation also, we have to focus on that part, that how they are going to impact, what is the property. Because we have already understood that there are only four uh, ways by which they can enter in our body. And if we know the properties of certain chemicals, they don't provide the catalyst to this chemical, don't provide say sunlight to this uh, particular chemical, then it will not show the exact property for which it is meant and it will reduce the effect the, of that particular uh, this thing. Now, typical effect of just for example, po example point, typical effects of sulfur dioxide concentration here. If you talk about sulfur dioxide part, so the concentration is enlisted. For example, ppm, you know, parts per million, it is 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 minimum order threshold for the response part. If the this amount of concentration of sulfur dioxide blend in the air, the response will be minimum order threshold <clears throat> and it could be say you know the lower side if the concentration is three sulfur dioxide order detectable up to this it is not detectable and this is a point say quantity quantity wherein 
we cannot detect properly but yes by the help of uh, experiment we can understood the property it is not very tough but exposure maybe could be long if the detection is 3 sulfur dioxide is detectable 6 to 12 immediate irritation to nose and throat will be found is it the concentration is 20 reversible damage to respiratory system greater than 20 eye irritation and tendency to pulmonary edema and eventually respiratory paralysis 10,000 irritation to more skin within a few minutes, which we use in the war type of situations. They use this type of material sulfur dioxide in the concentration 10,000. My point is that if we are able to understand, okay, up to this level, up to this level, at this level, we can easily mitigate. For example, up to 6, 12, and 20 also, if we know that sulfur dioxide is present nearby the source or I nearby the source, and if we are able to understand, okay, there is irritation in the nose, throat or I am causing uh, eye irritation that means there is certain certain chemical present in the atmosphere due to the leakage or spillage type of thing this this should be understood that okay this can be from uh, any effect concentration for sulfur dioxide is known similarly for any chemicals whichever we are using in our nearby premises or ambient system we can easily detect the concentration and what is the response which we can took place without any technology without any this thing yeah we, we, we can easily understood that okay it, it is irritating to nose and throat it is causing eye irritation so it could be more than 20 it could be more than 20 it could be nearby 20 it is very easy to detect but these are the you know, industrial uh, say quantification of data which tells us what is the response by the human body or the human behavior in extreme cases, irritant chemicals can have a corrosive actions. Corrosive substance can also attack living tissues, example to cause skin ulceration and in severe cases, chemical burns and degradation of biochemicals and charring. Kind kill cells and possibly predispose the secondary bacterial invasion. Thus, whilst acute irritation is a local and reversible response, corrosion is irreversible cell destruction at the site of contact. So again, it is very much tough about the corrosive uh, chemicals. The outcome is, outcome is influenced by the nature of compound, the concentration, duration of exposure, the pH, and also to some extent by individual susceptibility, susceptibility etc. Thus, dilute mineral acids may be retained, whereas the high concentration they may have corrosion. Same chemical, for example, I talked about mineral acids may be retained and corrosive cor 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 uh, reaction also. So, in this figure, most of the chemistry people will be knowing the pH. Uh, level at 7 it is neutral above side you can say is the strong acid 6543210 and the near side it is weak base or uh, in the last time 1314 strong base so how this line shows increasing acidity and this line shows in increasing our basicity or alkalinity this is a chemical term but okay only for the figure part i have put it here as in responder if you are not knowing the subject and we as in lab people we can analyze the situation but as a responder only we have to focus upon the effect on the human body effect on the community effect on the society as a disaster professional what we have to do in the pre phase what we have to do in the during phase and what we have to do in the post phase is our basic basic thought process to understand these slides summary of more common corrosive chemicals are chemicals which give strong acidations often on interaction with water example mineral acids these are the chemicals which react with water and it is very much pertinent. Some organic acids can also be corrosives. Phenolics can result in local anesthesia so that the pain will be absent for a time. That is, content may go unheated. Then halogen compounds are there. Common bases are there. Certain oxidizing, redu reducing com uh, compounds and salts which in the form of solid or solution can produce irritation by thermal burns. Strong acids and alkalis produce effects with moments. Example, sulfuric nit acid nitric acid quickly becomes hydrated with water content of the skin membranes and combined with the skin proteins to form albuminate sometimes with chairing. So all these terms of chemical but yes these these things uh, create problems. Burns under the fingernails are notable in this respect because of the difficulties of treatment. Similarly inhalation of the vapor can cause corrosion of the respiratory system and pulmonary edema. If hydrofluoric acid is solid burns to the mouth can occur with vomiting and ultimately collapse. So, depending on the chemical, for example, we are talking about this hydrofluoric acid, it is if swallowed, burns to the mouth and fangs and can occur with vomiting and ultimate collapse. So, all these are corrosive chemicals and it is very much available in our industrial zones or some of you are working in any MH unit, then in that case, you are easily understood, okay, this type of particular chemical is being used. 
or if you can see the transportation mechanism also these are being transported to here and there but what are the impact of these uh, chemicals is listed to us to, to some extent but not we will not go in, inside very in depth of the chemical chemistry part but yes as in uh, responders we can easily understand okay this these are the impacts now there are certain things which we call as sensitizers you can you can see the figure what happened in the, the this thing uh, part of the body these are things which is common to us we have seen this type of fascias in our body not nearby you cannot you will you have not noticed inside the public zone you can see this type of issues in the industrial zones so generally sensitizers may not uh, on first contact result in any ill effects although cellular changes can be induced and body immune system affected so these basically will not show any issues on the first go you have passed through an area where sensitizer chemicals are there it will not create big problems such certain type of irritation will be felt but not for the long time after few those who are working in this sensitizer chemicals after say one month two month three months year depending on the exposure time it, it will come into this picture subsequent exposure to the same or related chemicals may bring about violent allergic response the person has become sensitized generally there is no mathematical relation between the degree of exposure and extent of the response depends on the human body and the susceptibility of the body how much it is being focused sensitization to a compound is usually high specific and normally occurs within about 10 days so it will take time although they have been causes of workers using chemical for years without untoward effects before developing an allergic dermatitis so it is also evident and we have seen in the industries that in chemicals also bare uh, handed uh, workers work they don't uh, use the ppes they don't use the shoes also and they are fit but it is not that the body is not uh, responding on the right way in the long time they will be converted to fire disease but the property of sensitizer is that, that within 10 days it will show some symptoms on the body on the upper layer but not uh, not always thus with industrial skin sensitizers example chromates or amines curing agents no effect is usually observed on the first exposure subsequent exposure results in inflammation of the skin and not to the areas of content generally what happened in the industries the workers when you go and meet the workers they will not tell you the exact problem they are facing due to the issues of job or they will say if the management knows that uh, we are facing certain uh, medical issues they will throw out us out or they will create some problem they will uh, form an inquiry type of thing they are unaware of the impact of these things it is very much curable but yes in the first impact they don't know they just think okay there is a small rash in our body maybe due to mosquito or due to rear and tear it, 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 it has come into picture but it is not obvious that so respiratory sensitizers example isocyanates or formaldehyde result in mild cases in a sense of tightness of chest and occasionally a troublesome cough severe cases involve bronchial asthma with such sensitizers complete cessation of contact is often followed by rapid, rapid recovery but no further exposure is generally permitted so in the uh, why i quoting these type of chemicals or this type of category classification also so that you could understand that a disaster is not that everybody is being killed everybody has been finished it is also the how the community is being affected why in an mh unit uh, say in a cluster there are around three lakh uh, workers and uh, in three lakh workers if three thousand is uh, complaining about the bronchial asthma or they are complaining about the sensitization or inflammation of the skin that that means a big percentage is being affected of the community it is not that in that three lakh everybody is affected but mild to below level how many people are affected is also a concern and it is being termed as a disaster point that the impact is community being affected and it is going beyond the coping capacity of that particular community section or industry as far as the ends, we have already fixed as far as the ends, interfering within the body's oxygen uptake mechanism air normally contains 21 oxygen we all know very well of oxygen deficiency is very much the important phenomena in xyz in inhaled air in in example due to the presence of nitrogen argon or carbon dioxide in a confined space depending on the concentration and duration may affect the body and ultimately cause death from simple anoxia the simple meaning is that as a layman language we are not able to get oxygen and the amount of oxygen is being cut by this particular as far as the example is very clear and we talk about in two two two, two categories if you break acids and anhydrides and alkalis you can see acetic acid acid mixtures battery fluid chromic acid nitric acid and perchloric acid spent acids and all these things are there we, we don't need to remember the name of the this thing but yes we only what we have to do there are classification and there are certain properties which work as an isophysians and alkalis also we have ammonium hydroxide 
sodium hydroxide casting soda which is easily available casting potash and casting soda is very much available in the market and outside premises also and these can be used as a common corrosive chemicals not for the this part for the production part or for the good part but yes on the negative side that will affect the human body and it will cut uh, it will deficient the oxygen from the ambient atmosphere then uh, in the similar categories we have halogens and halogen salts interhalogen compounds organic halides organics these are the chemical properties only for the sewing part that if you talk about the cluster of chemicals also they will fall into some jurisdiction and when you club this jurisdiction you will see right from the alkalis acids halogens organic halides ester salts everybody there are certain number of chemicals which will work as an asphyxiant it's not like that they will say okay sir i have written or the company says these type of chemicals this has the property uh, of doing something uh, producing something but yes as an technical point or as a disaster professional we can understood okay these chemicals may be used in asphyxiant and or maybe it is being used in asphyxiant or it is showing the property of asphyxiant that's why my workers or the community is feeling ill feeling sick and or complaining certain type of problems chloro silence miscellaneous chorus substance also hydrogen peroxide soda lime sodium aluminate some chemicals which you have heard i'm not telling you i'm not going to teach you in chemistry this part but yes these are the mixtures example cleaning disinfecting bleaching degreasing solid solutions it all these things can be utilized and miscellaneous chlorine substance and it will do the same thing it will deficient the oxygen and it will create problem so cleaning disinfecting bleaching not think on the smaller note that cleaning a wall cleaning an industry which have or cleaning a storage tank which was earlier filled with a corrosive substance or which and chemical which can show the nature of asphyxiant why when somebody is cleaning a tank and he don't knows or degreasing solids are there or he is doing bleaching so in the in these industrial situations all these chemicals play a big role and they shows the property or they fall in the category of asphyxiant and that's why it will create issues to the community this is our basic uh, thought process and there we have to go we don't know the nature of chemical yes but in the property of the chemical it could be xyz it could be chlorinated benzyl chrysols but whenever we are using if we know that okay it will fall in the category of asphyxiant i don't need to remember no know the chemical but yes i know the property what it can do this is the important part common industrial skin sensitizers again it will show you figure type of this and it is not very common when you go in the industries you will see that all these things Coal tar and direct derivative derivatives. Tar you all have heard about tar. Naphthalene you have heard and all these things. Then we have dyes. It is very much common and used in the industries. And dye intermediates also. What it will affect? It is it will do in this way. It will completely finish the skin of the workers from the users from the affected community. I am quoting only this because it is not that everybody dies from the chemical, but yes, what can these chemicals impact effect on the bodies? And uh, you can see the figures. It will completely finish your upper uh, layer of skin, and uh, <coughs> ultimately inside the tissues will be breakdown. Then we have explosives, ammonium nitrate. You have heard, and we have given the example of barut. Insecticides are there. Natural resins, oils. Photographic developers, plasticizers, rubber acetates, antioxidants, synthetic resins, and others, and derived. So all these will fall under this skin sensitizers, and it will create some issues to the skin. Depend on the exposure and dose. I will explain in the coming slide what is the, the dose and concentration. But yes, these all chemicals play a similar role, role, and it will create a big problem. Are you seeing the basic mode of route of entry will be absorption only in this case. Now, sub, sub, some substances recognizing as causing occupational asthma. This is also a big thing which we have to focus upon. You, you all see the example of use. You will easily correlate what I try to communicate to you. Plastic foam, synthetic inks, paints, adhesives you are very commonly using. Yes, we are using on a very, very lower level, lower lay, level. That is why it is not impacting to us. But though in the industries or places which are using on a bulk level, they are producing foam they are using synthetic inks you they are using adhesive they are producing plastics it will create big problem and it will cause occupational asthma the substance involved all these things for example plastic foam synthetic inks paints will be isocyanates talking about simple um, any other issues you can easily see electronic industry will create problem about the fumes 
from the use of resin so it's being flux similarly for the manufacturing dispensing part we have antibiotics example hydrazilin ampicillin or spiramycin so these are the examples i have quoted you for all this could be shared this will be shared to you you can easily understood the examples of use for example polymer manufacture hair dye treatments preserving resins foam manufacture fish and process industry there are certain chemicals which is creating issues now the the question will uh, come to this part that uh, what is the issue in this issue is that occupational asthma again is it's a disease it will not come into notifiable disease and you are not a worker or the community is not a worker so they are not covered under the act but yes on the impact part many pop uh, populations of new nearby community will be uh, facing this type of issues uh, that uh, the electronic industry is nearby and uh, nearby village people are telling that they are facing some uh, issues of asthma so this is what i am telling you and uh, these are the community part also and the workers who so were is involved in this industries they are also uh, potential say victim of all this uh, this thing in on a on a on a longer period of time during the manufacturing industries or say uh, whatever i have written over here they 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 come and uh, generally they got occupational asthma in their fields <sighs> typical effects of depleted oxygen levels in air talking about the oxygen concentration in percentage if the oxygen concentration is 16 to 21 no noticeable effect is shown 12 to 16 it will increase respiration and slightly diminution of coordinations if the oxygen concentration goes to 10 to 12 loss of ability to think clearly and 6 to 10 loss of consciousness and death so it is very clearly that we could understand the oxygen part why in industries when we use chemicals or generally we can see if the atmosphere is not clear or in, 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 in the atmosphere is hazy in normal circumstances we also complain that we it is big, difficult to respirate and we are facing some problem but if the, the atmosphere is quite clear the wind is uh, is there the sun is there in that case we will not uh, but in case of industries there are n number of confined states in construction industry also there are n number of confined space in that case all these are noticeable what is the oxygen concentration and what is the effect of the workers say just giving an example if loss of ability to think clearly if a worker is not able to define properly you asking what are you wearing whatever is your helmet he is not able to tell you then again you can think on that part okay the oxygen concentration may be on the lower side it is 10 to 12 that is why two to four people and again it will depend on the number of population affected so if if say 10 people or 15 people 15 workers are complaining in the same way i am facing you just correlate the same example with the vizac siren leakage there also when people start to started complaining I am the facing problem, I am facing problem, and the community started problem, then only it is being noticed, okay, there is a contamination or exposure to certain material, which is unknown. In later half, we got to know, okay, this is tiring the atmosphere, but what happened? The level of chemical increased and the, the, the level of oxygen downgrades. So these all things are required and we have to, as a disaster professional, we have to presume or anticipate this could be a probable case and in case of CBR and per se, it is very very anticipated type of mechanism you will not get any sop or you will not get any mobile type of thing or material that you will analyze and go in the atmosphere you will see okay this is a chemical this is a radioactive material in one which is very tough in the radioactive part yes you can do tell but in case of biological and chemical it is very tough to detect on site regarding which type of chemical is it is only a symptomatic type of basis people show similar symptoms as they show showing normal diseases only the thing is that differentiate between the, the, the effects which we are noticed on a regular basis. So levels below 19.5% oxygen can have detrimental effects if the body is already under stress. For example, at high altitudes, exposures below 18% should not be permitted under any circumstances. Other chemicals, example, carbon monoxide result in toxic anoxia due to the damage of body oxygen, transport or utilization mechanism. Here also I have tried to show this sense, right? Concentration of 21%, 18%, 16 to 12 14 to 9, 10 to 6, and 6 percent less. So it could be used by you. Anybody can use this type of uh, uh, placards and can be displayed in the <coughs> communities or say industries where the uh, this type of chemicals are available, which can reduce the level of oxygen in the ambient air. Then we have some certain categories like anesthetics and narcotics, which we have seen. These are example hydrocarbons, certain directives such as various chlorinated solvents or ether. Exerted depression action, which we have on the central nervous system, systematic poison attacks organ other than the initial side of contact. The critical organs are kidney, liver, blood, and bone marrow. For example, they are being uh, <clears throat> this type of poison entered from any part of the body, but it will directly focus on the kidney. 
liver, blood or bone marrow. Respiratory fibrogens. The hazard of particular matter is influenced by the toxicity. It is very much important. Earlier it was found in the industry, but right now in the atmosphere also we can see and notice that particular matter is quite dispersed. It is not uh, <clears throat> settling down with the effect of water also. Right now we all have to do something or we have to prepare some chemicals which will stick on that this dust and it will settle down that it will not go up, up again. What happened? Then temperature changes and on the high temperature again, this dust particles will go on the upper side and it will create problems. The critical size of dust particles is 0.5 to 7 micrometer. It's huge, not micro. Since these can decompose, it can it can become deposited in the respiratory bronchitis and alveoli. If dust particles of specific chemicals, example silica or the various grades of asbestos, are not cleared from the lungs, then over a period, scar tissues may build up. This reduces the elasticity of the lungs and impairs breathing. The characteristic disease is called pneumoconiosis. Pneumoconiosis is a very common uh, disease which comes into industries and again common examples are silicosis, asbestosis, coal pneumoconiosis and talc pneumoconiosis. Supreme Court also has given directives 5-10 years back regarding the study of asbestos and silicosis. Why? Silica is very much prevalent in western parts of Rajasthan and some other parts of the country. So the central government has formulated a team under the directives of, of Supreme Court and studies have done and it has been found out that n number of industries are having this type of silica material asbestosis and workers are facing this problem of pneumoconiosis which is very very prevalent in this case if you are say in the pictorial form you will see the lungs will be completely finished like elasticity of limb refills the, the the basic portions of the lungs is also not found in many cases we have seen that uh, the actual lung is not uh, half of the lung has been finished we don't when we go for the x-ray part we are not able to see where is your lung 50 60 percent lung is already finished due to the uh, over a long time they are uh, inhaling the asbestos fibers silico sil silica powder and ultimately it uh, it is converted into a notifier disease which, which, which is very very tough it is uh, almost uh, we cannot cure it at any cost it is not curable uh, to, to more extent only we have to the, the person whosoever is being focused or those person who is affected it will ultimately be finished in a few few years or say days whatever is the time limit on the exposure an appreciation of the composition and morphology of dust is important assessment of hazard so we, we have to know what type of material is present in the ambient atmosphere thus among silica containing compounds crystalline silicates and amorphous silica silicon dioxide are generally not considered fibrogenic whereas free crystalline silica and certain fiber fibrous silicates such as asbestos and tals can cause disabling lung disease so basic contributor is asbestos which is being found and right now it is Band, but also if you go for the ship part, ship breaking part, the old ships or almost most of the ships uses a huge amount of asbestos. And when we break these ships, then also the particular areas are very well prone to this type of disease of asbestosis, silicosis, or pneumoconiosis. Now we have carcinogens. Cancer is a disorder of the body control of the growth of cells. The disease may be genetic or influenced by lifestyle or exposure to certain chemicals terms carcinogens for a list of examples of human, uh, human chemical carcinogens and relevant target toxins for example if we go for the this right hand slide carcinogens occupation process and cancer type rubber industry leather industry benzene aluminium production etc will cause bladder cancer <laughs> herbicides benzene radiation system will cause hematopoietic and lymphatic sunlight will cause lip Asbestos will cold. This mustard gas will flow pharynx. So these wherever we have the occupation process and this cancer will be there. And these are the chemicals which is very much important. Now go for the left side. You can easily see the, the low size is the particle diameter in micrometer. We have 10 to power 6 to 10 to power minus 4. Where I try to try to shape what was this coal dust, tobacco smoke, atmospheric dust, foundry dust agriculture spray oil smoke clays silt pine coarse gravel all these things when we combine all these things we have some diameters and it will go for the vulnerability part and all these are quite related to the carcinogens or cancer causing chemicals <laughs> now we'll ask again which type of chemicals so i have already tried to list that yes you can see on the left side a number of chemicals are there but what are the effect side effect and type of issues related to the body for example bladder skin lung liver will be focused or by arsenic and certain compounds whichever is used by arsenic it will cause this uh, particular 
chemicals will cause cancer on the skin part lung or liver then we have benzene say say we have mustard gas it will focus on the respiratory tract we have vinyl chloride it will go for liver brain lung lymphatic system we have nickel refining so whenever you go in the industries and see you will see the process and with the process you can correlate okay what are these issues can be there what are the problems which we can focus what are the uh, uh, sites are affected bladder ling, lung uh, skin uh, uh, or uh, respiratory tract all things be things about, are affected by the list of chemicals uh, written over there and working but yes only for the example point i have tried to write some certain chemicals and effect of uh, these chemicals on the bodies now chemicals which are probably carcinogenic in humans so we have instead certain chemicals during the sharing of the slide the sharing of the ppts to you you can easily understand and you can only for the uh, uh, learning process we are focusing on this part that for ethyl nitrate there it will affect the human on colon on lung if there is oramine what will focus it will focus on the bladder part we have nickel certain compounds it will directly focus on the respiratory tract we have have <coughs> Thyrotepa will focus on the blood. These are the chemicals which is directly affecting the body, and it's very pertinent that for a longer exposure time, it will definitely clearly <coughs> create issues on our body parts. Now, coming to the assessment, now we have understood okay, these are the chemicals, the irritant, aspizant, hazards <coughs> are there, some uh, oxygen is not present. We have a number of things we have. Now, how we will uh, quantify, how will we ascertain that these are things come into picture? So, there are two parameters that is LD15 and LC15. Indicators of toxicity hazards include LD50 and LC50, plus a wide range of in vitro and even vitro techniques. But we will focus generally. Yeah, screen is visible. Hello. Rohit, can you hear me? No, sir. No. Yeah. No visible. Yes, sir. You can hear me? We can Yes, yes. It is visible yes. right now? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Not these slides. So we are focusing on two parts? Not these slides. Slides are not visible, sorry. No. The slide is visible right now? Yes. Okay. So we are focusing upon the LD15, LC50 part. LD is the lethal dose 15, LC is the LD15. Plus a wide range of uh, in vitro and in vivo techniques for assessment of skin and irritation, skin sensitization, acute and chronic dermal or inhalation toxicity, reproductive toxicity, carcinogenicity. Because this is the two parameters which it basically gives the test results. The LD50 is statistically derived single dosage of a substance that can be ex expected to cause death of 50 percent of sample population this we will ascertain like that it is therefore an indicator of acute toxicity usually determined by ingestion using rats or mice although animals may be ld50 is also determined by other routes example by skin absorption in rabbits the values are affected by species sex and age ld50 if you understand as in what we do we use say for example we take 10 or 100 rats or mice and we uh, we uh, give them something to eat and they ingest uh, by root of ingestion they take this material so how many of the test test uh, sample 50% uh, of sample population are deaf so we expect that 50% should be uh, uh, sh should be dead by consuming this type of material so by this we go for the dose part lethal dose of this particular chemical is this we have provided certain chemicals to uh, 100 mice and if 50% we expect to be dead. If they are dead, 50%, the lethal dose is 50. Similarly, there is 30, 70, 50. How many percentage has been killed when we give the certain chemicals? We have, for example, we have given sulfur dioxide and say 50% test, test uh, animal is being killed or dead, then we can assume, okay, LD50 of this particular chemical is this. Similarly, we have LC50, it is called lethal concentration of chemical, example in air or water. That will cause death of 50 percent of sample population simply we will give some concentration say for example 5 ppm we have given and say in 150 rats got killed then we will ascertain that okay the lethal concentration is 50 percent 30 percent got killed we will say lc 30 and similarly lc 70. 
So this is most appropriate as an indicator of the acute toxicity of the chemicals in air breath or in water for aquatic systems. So these are the toxicity rating system commonly used as extremely toxic. You can easily see LT50 for four hours time. What is the vapor exposure causing two to four deaths in six rat group? So the figure I have given is for extremely toxics. <coughs> Less than 0 0.001 and less than 10 for 4 hours. Similarly, L50 is less than 0 0.05. Probable and lethal dose for humans, 1 grain. <clears throat> 1 grain is sufficient for extremely to toxic. Any material, if it is 1 grain and uh, the, <clears throat> the, the percentage or the gram per kilogram unit is uh, 0.001, we can easily accept it. Similarly, for highly toxic, we have some figures. 1 teaspoon for human death, moderate toxics, 30 gram. Slightly toxic 250 grams, practically non toxic 500 grams, and relatively harmless could be any figure. So, this is the dose which is very problematic for the human part for chemicals. For chemicals, they have utilized, they have given single dose for this particular thing, and 50% population got uh, finished. After four hours of exposure, what is this thing, the figure? This is there. And so, in this basic of quantification, uh, we go for the parameter part and we understood that, okay. For the human part, all these parameters are quite important. This is called a toxicity rating system. Now, some more things which is very much important is hygiene standards for industrial chemical disasters. If we are going to maintain all these things, it is uh, easy for us to mitigate any disasters. And there are certain bodies also who may and uh, this thing for uh, industrial hygiene part. Hygiene standards are employed for as indicators of risk to men from inhalation of toxic and nuisance chemicals at work. Some indication of risk of employee exposure to airborne chemicals can be gauged from an analysis of the level of exposure for comparison with, with known human dose response data, such as those of carbon monoxide and hydrogen sulfide. More commonly, the reference is published hygiene standards based on human epidemiology, animal data, and extrapolation from in information of related chemicals with the built in safety factor. And this is the body ACGIH, American Conference of Government Industrial Hygienists. <clears throat> it gives the values of TLVs, means what is the threshold limit value of. Uh, inhalation of toxic and nuisance chemicals. It couldn't do. UK equivalents published health HSC uh, uh, executive uh, known as occupational exposure limits or OELs. So ACGIs and OELs are basically the bodies which uh, publish the data of the industrial hygiene system and uh, how what, what amount of uh, chemicals is uh, safe or say what is the saturation limit is being given by these bodies. So talking about the TLV part. Threshold value, uh, limit values, these values represent airborne concentration of substance to which it is believed that nearly all workers may be repeatedly exposed by inhalation day after day without adverse health effects. If it is maintained, it's okay. If there is certain variation, then again, it will be a big problem of the workers' health because of the wide variation of individual stability. However, a small percentage of workers may experience discomfort from the some substance at concentration below the TLV. Uh, I'm not giving the data. I will share you in the later on if you all require the TLV of the chemicals which we focus upon. The, this is the threshold limit value. But yes, in, whenever you go in an industry, there is a data which is being provided to the industry and uh, a check is being kept by the state government that they are uh, uh, following the norms or they are following the threshold limit values. But when we talk about these particular scenarios for the <laughs> unauthorized factories, or wherever the chemical is being leaked to the community, then it is very tough for us to ascertain how much type of their chemicals they have taken because all are airborne concentrations, so they can uh, go anywhere uh, on the mechanism of diffusion. Because of the wide variation of induced stability, however, uh, a smaller percentage may experience aggravation of a pre existing condition, unless age, genetic factors, or personal habits may some induce uh, hypersensitivity. Physical factors like uh, ultraviolet ionizing radiations, humidity, abnormal atmosphere pressure, excessive temperatures, or over time working may add stress to the body uh, so that effects from the exposure at a TLV may be altered. Therefore, best occupational hygiene practice is to maintain levels of all air contaminants as low as reasonably practicable. So, this depends on the thing, but yes, on a disaster point of view, if this type of TLV is not maintained and uh, the workers or the communities focusing or facing these issues, then it will uh, create big problem on the community's health. Then we have some order thresholds. Uh, this is also there, which we can uh, witness. Why? Because order is sense, sense, uh, sense uh, we can easily say it is a sense type of mechanism. We can sense the order. We can uh, ascertain that there is, there is an issue in the atmosphere. So these are some materials causes low order thresholds. The smell gives warning of impending dangers. 
other causes order thresholds well in excess of the hygiene standard examples are included reliance <coughs> on the nose as an indicator however can be hazardous since untrained exposures may not understand the significance of order some material with low order threshold may paralyze the olfactory nerves and cause the sense of smell to be lost within minutes example hydrogen sulfide some materials are orderless nitrogen they are they will also cause problem but they are orderless some materials such as arsine, phosphine, toluene, diisocyanide, and styrene may be present concentration in excess of their hygiene standards, yet undetectable for the smell. And uh, this is the basic cause for the disaster part. What we do, what we have to do in case of uh, undetectable chemicals, which has some threshold, but we are not able to detect. Published other threshold values may vary very widely from source to source. Now, risk assessment of carcinogens. <clears throat> it is also important, but uh, uh, it focuses on the how to ascertain the risk because carcinogen is a, for a big a big time. Arguably, risk assessment from exposure to carcinogens merits special consideration because of the low level of exposure capable of producing an adverse response in certain individuals coupled with the often long time lag. What we call the latency period between exposure and the on, onset of diseases. There are several formal lists of carcinogens. Thus, in the UK, under the control of substances hazardous to health regulation 99, carcinogens, carcinogens are defined as any substance or preparation which is classified in accordance with the classification provided or by regulation 5 of the chemicals, same as Schedule 2 and 3 of MSIC rules, uh, hazard information by supply, regulation 1994, as amended, would be the category of danger carcinogen, carcinogenic category 1 or carcinogenic category. I will share this particular uh, PDF to you where you can understand. What uh, actually they want, what they uh, want to say about the regulation part from uh, UK's perspective. Now, the last part of my presentation in, is in the uh, chemical part is basically focusing on the safety management system, which must be integrated for the chemical industrial sectors or uh, to mitigate the chemical disaster. It should be basically two parts focusing first on the organization structure, which will include the roles, responsibility, education, training, qualification, and interrelationship of individuals as well as contracted organizations and personals involved in work affecting safety. Second is identification of hazards and evolution of risk. This is very much important, which will cover developing and implementing formal procedures in to systematically identify hazards and evaluate them, including their likelihood and severity arising from. For example, we have focusing upon the substances, handling, production, transportation, storage, disposal. Again, this is much required and there is a location surrounding of the site and other external factors of the site in particular. The impact of natural hazards that may result in NATEC. This is a term which is very much important. Natural hazard triggered technological accidents. What we are focusing on, there is an earthquake, and due to earthquake, there is a, <clears throat> a shaking of the earth, and uh, ultimately, the impact is on the tank forms of a refinery, which is uh, uh, having uh, dangerous chemicals. So, these are things which we are focusing upon. Uh, so, hazard refers to an inherent property of a substance. Risk means the likelihood of a specific effect. This, mo most of the things are being covered. Uh, in the earlier lectures of the hazard and risk facilities and operation control addressing design and construction as well as the procedures of safe operation including maintenance of plant process equipment and temporary stoppage taking account of aging etc should be taken into consideration for this particular part natac as we are fixing natural hazards such as earthquake flood or storms can initiate events which may challenge the safety and operation of hazards installations and trigger accidents those accidents are referred to as NATEC or natural hazard triggered technological accidents. Most of the installations that process, store, or handle a hazard substance can, in principle, be vulnerable to the impact of natural hazards. And country like India, or just think about the Golden Corridor from Bhuj to Wapi in Gujarat, where 35% of the MH unit exists, and we have 35% of the hazardous chemicals in that particular zone only. If there is a big tsunami or say major earthquake, then what happened to these chemicals? And secondary disaster will come, or you can say not. Incident. We have to fight for the earthquake or tsunami. Unfortunately, what we are seeing that there is a leakage of uh, hazardous chemical or fumes are there, and uh, it is very effective to mitigate or fight with two parallel disasters. Data and projections show that the frequency and intensity of natural hazards linked to the climate change will increase in the decades to come, and may some may occur at locations where they have been observed before. Coupled with the growing of human expansion, industrialization, urbanization, integration of climate changes, and uncertainty. So, technology disasters, yes, because we are talking about chemical industrial disaster management. Wherever chemicals are stored and there is a impact of uh, natural disasters, it is tough to mitigate the situation at one time. Now, there are four types of uh, NATEX, which will four types of changes that are important for NATEX: intentional change, modification. 
unintentional and incremental organization change, including change of ownership and change in the vicinity of site related to land use planning. Studies from the past accidents clearly show that a vast portion of chemical accidents have resulted from a failure to screen or analyze the impact of proposed change on risk, whether temporary or permanent. I, as I started in the lecture in the first class also, I told you chemical disasters can be mitigated very easily if we go with the proper SOPs and proper steps. It is very tough to, until unless there is a very big disaster, or say earthquake of 8 or 10 uh, come to picture, until unless it is no, very, very tough to go for the chemical disaster per se. So in case of intentional changes or modification, we have to establish formal procedures to ensure that no modification compromises safety management of hazardous installations. <clears throat> should establish formal procedures to ensure that no modification to plant, equipment, process, software, facilities, procedures compromise safety. Modification procedures should apply to both permanent and temporary changes and should be based on appropriate up-to-date process documentation where and where appropriate a physical inspection of the installation. All proposals to make modification to a hazardous installations should be recorded, documented and assessed so that necessary hazard analysis and risk assessments are carried out. The appropriate design changes are made and modifications are properly engineered and recorded. This is for the intentional change where in any industry or occupier or the owner wants to modify its process. Then in that case, formal procedure should be very, very much strictly adhered. Second is an unintentional or incremental changes that we have seen in certain industry during welding process. There is a confined space having an inflammable chemical. It got blast or due to static charge, complete, complete, uh, completely got finished in Gujarat and Maharashtra uh, states. We have seen n number of cases due to static charges. Chem uh, the fumes or gases or vapor are there. Static charge during welding process come into this picture and a huge blast, ultimately, a huge blast come into the picture. So it should be recognized that the sum of minor changes can be equivalent to a major change. Minor changes may, may be unintended results of alterations elsewhere in the process. Technique should be developed to assess how a series of minor changes in installation taken together could affect the safety and what could be done to mitigate and with any increased potential for chemical accidents. Organizational change include the change of ownership procedures should exist to ensure that changes in management, labor and organization do not compromise safety, including, for example, changes in the corporate structure or financing, downsizing of the staff and outsourcing of certain activities, which we have seen in various issues. If we give our borders to any outsource agency, what will happen, you can easily understand. Or if we see or uh, it's from its private uh, this thing, then they will focus on the economy or money part. Um, maybe they will not focus on the welfare of the people. All this will come into picture. In that case only, the, the <laughs> issues come. Third is organizational change. It is a very big spectrum. It is being, the organization is a structure within which individuals and group of people interact with each other. The organization defines hierarchies, field of responsibility and activities. This means that changes in the organizations are changes in hierarchies, responsibilities and activities. Very much important for uh, us because it is an integrated process. It is not that we, you have brought or purchased a hazardous chemical and in that case, your completely team has been changed. They told, okay, I don't know what to do with chemical. The changes can have impact on the safety facilities that handle hazardous substances. Example of organization changes are two, change of ownership and outsourcing and direction of internal capacities. New owners may have a different safety culture, different level of knowledge and competency with respect of safety and prevention and preparedness for chemical accidents. They are also likely to have different organization structures and different distribution of responsibilities. They will say, no, my people will sit on this post who is not technically competent and he have, he will do the process part or he will do the transportation part because he is close to me or my this is my company. So again, these issues come into the picture. Outsourcing and direction of internal capacities. If maintenance activities or the engineering department are externalized, that is moved off site away from the installations or more stream are outsourced and become a separate company, then this can have a significant impact on the chemical accident prevention and preparedness. Interventions that have to be requested have a header header. This header is greater when explicit costs are involved, such costs may be internal charging mechanism or external contract. So this is also a big thing due to the contract part, outsourcing part. Certain companies thought that cost cutting is a good thing, but it compromises safety at various spectrums. And the fourth part is changes in the vicinity of site related to land planning. That means it is Going to take some uh, other place, the inclusion of land use planning is related in relation to significant accidents has emerged as a novel solution under the CO2 directive. CO2 directive is a chemical directive. We will uh, discuss it later on. In addition to this stipulation, it is worth noting the significant significance of this matter in relation to the management of significant incidents at a national level. Various criteria are in use based either on generic distances or on the level of consequences or on the level of risk. 
at the regional or local levels the consideration of local specificities and the existence of various and often contracted objectives such as need to mitigate risk while simultaneously maximizing the benefits derived from the land exploitation appears to significantly influence the decision making process so this is like a big thing vicinity of the site if you are changing site for example you have we have seen the example of the yamuna flood zone in the past one or two years where last year also when we see the the, the flood came in delhi we have seen that uh, the the flood zone has been occupied by various bodies even we got the news and we can you all have heard that the yamuna was once uh, flowing nearby that uh, uh, lal kila so you can easily understand that we have captured this particular zone similar case of industries where we have planted we have seen uh, the government has provided certain zone only you have to uh, establish your industry this type of industry in this particular zone only and uh, due to uh, company or manufacturing industry due to their cons uh, facilities of their uh, this thing they had transported all this thing or they want to, to change the vicinity side it still impact the uh, safety issues of chemical process now the last uh, part of my this presentation was principles of engine safety we focus upon the minimize or intensify reducing the amount of hazard substance present at any time by using smaller batches this could be done reducing the storage of intermediates to the to the quantities required transfer operations are the most hazardous part of the process in this case we can go for the substitution part or moderate part substitute means replacing a hazardous substance with a substance of less hazard example lower toxicity or non carcinogenic to avoid exposure to the workforce or the public in the event of accident moderate attenuate using less hazardous conditions a less hazardous form of a material or facilities that minimize the impact of hazardous material or energy so these are things which we can it is not very tough thing to understand but yes for the understanding part these are the principles of engine safety we, we, we can simplify eliminating problems by design and just avoiding thus avoiding complexity rather than adding additional equipment to deal with the problems and making operations errors more likely in addition these are two further principles can be used <laughs> error tolerance and limit effects designing equipment and process to be sufficiently robust so that they can withstand possible faults or deviations from design you all all, all have heard about this plc and scada type of thing wherein any and you any change in the pipeline in any downfall in the pressure on increment temperature is being reported to the control room a person sitting in the computer can ideally understand the complete line where the process is going on where are the issues there is a lower side to the pressure temperature or any other parameter so you can easily be understood over there so we have to develop our robust system and limits limit effects by designing the system so that the worst possible conditions will be automatically mitigated for example sloping the concrete surface below a horizontal tank to take flammable liquid away from a safer place providing bonds and retention to the prevent retention to prevent hazardous liquid spreading to undesired location there should be automatic system maybe you can use robotic arms you can use robots we can use ai tools we can use anything which is uh, which can be uh, on the basis of <coughs> Say and uh, its own capability can uh, mitigate the situation. Procedure, uh, and procedures should be de designed to minimize the chance of failure. And uh, should be uh, should there be failure to prevent and minimize adverse effects. So the, the the responsibility responsible efforts of the chemical industry. The efforts include continually improve in their health, safety, and environmental performance. Listen, respond to public concerns. Assist each other to achieve optimum performance. Report their goals and progress to the public. The control framework of CIDRR is cost consists of binding requirements that out in, for example, laws and regulations include provisions for conducting inspections, audits to verify the safety of hazardous installations during all phases of the life cycle, include provisions for the enforcement of requirements, and performance mechanism should in, uh, include suitable sanctions with penalties applicable in the event of non-compliance, allow flexibility in the methods used to meet the requirements, public authority should consider Tiring requirements in proportion to the level of risk include standards, codes, and guidance. Such codes, such as codes of practice and quality assurance guides, these should be designed to enable each interested party to determine whether the safety objects are being met. Give particular attention to ensuring that all enterprises undertake appropriate assessment of the range of possible strengths, including low probability, high consequence strengths, and appropriate emergency planning. Public authorities may establish different reporting requirements for different categories of installations becoming more comprehensive for those installations regarded as presenting the greatest potential this is a very big thing right now we are focusing on single single uh, window mechanism we don't have any uh, proper mechanism for so that data can be fetched which is going to happen and if there is an uh, uh, unintentional effect in the com company or uh, the, the, the installation has potential hazards so this this is uh, important thing the level of details of such report should be 
commensurate with the extent of hazard at the installation. The report may consider harmonized formats and use agreed definitions. Public authorities should review the reports they receive by, for example, examining their completeness, assessing the risk control measures with regard to being effective and appropriate, and as an appropriate carrying out on-site inspection to verify the information report. Conclusion. Chemical accident prevention, preparedness and response are by nature an interdisciplinary activity involving authorities in different sectors and different levels with relevant mandates such as environmental protection, public health, civil protection, emergency response, occupational safety and industry development. Examples of such authorities include national, regional, local authorities, government inspectors, civil protection energies, public health authorities, health providers, city, country, provincial agencies responsible for public health and safety, response personnel and elected officials at all levels. Where more than one competent public authority exists, a coordinated mechanism should be established in order to minimize overlapping activities and conflicts in the implementation of requirement from various public authorities. Public authorities should endeavor to harmonize regulations among the various national and local authorities to the extent possible, eliminate duplicate requirements. Inspections are a critical element in ensuring the overall safety of inspections. Recognize the element of inspections and enforcement program. Public authorities should establish appropriate inspection and enforcement programs for monitoring safety of hazardous installations in all phases of their life cycle. This, this includes planning, setting, design, construction, operation, including maintenance. Relevant act and rules shall be properly monitored by the relevant officials. So with this, I thank you for the slides. I think I am more than the time. So now I think I will I will take the questions, if any. Hello. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hello, sir. So there are a few questions. Yes, Students has yeah. sent message. You can see. Okay. Doubt some script. Script. Hmm. Yes, for the geographical mapping part, hazardous vulnerability has been done, but not for the chemical part. We only we have the clustering of MS units, which has been done ten years back. Where uh, we have MH zones, major accidental hazard zones, we have been identified. Right now, it is the figure is not uh, exactly known, but it is more than 8, 1800 something. It has been done 10 years back. So, right now, there is no that issues. The auditing system is basically for the industrial part. The auditing uh, subject is depend uh, has been bifurcated in two parts state governments or Department of Industrial Safety and Health along with the chief inspector of factories have the provisions to identify to cross check the any any industry any time as per the provisions of act 1948 along with that we have uh, for hazardous installations uh, section 41 cb of factories act tells about the procedures which we have to follow plus we have provisions for auditing in ms ic rules manufacturing storage and import of hazardous chemical 1989 where the chemicals can be enlisted Okay, the laws, as I already quoted, Factories Act, MSIC rules, and in certain extents, we have the bodies like CPCB, which go for the pollution part. If certain uh, this thing is uh, being uh, transported, if the area is being polluted, parallelly we have two more things that is what that we called as offsite plan, uh, which will be integrated into district disaster management plan. Generally, what happen? Companies make on-site plan where they in MS units basically. Uh, if they are using scheduled two or three chemicals, then they will formulate an on-site plan and that plan will be submitted to the district government and district government parallelly will integrate this on-site plan into their off-site plan. In the off-site plan, we will get the details of all the hazardous units present in the industry along with the chemicals plus quantities, whatever, what, whatever they are using over there. This will help us in case of any accident, which chemicals they are using, what are the antidotes, what are the mutual aid schemes, we can easily ascertain and we can respond promptly and quickly. So I hope I have given the this thing the part of the slides part in slides part actually the net was break for a few minutes then it came back so I think slides was uh, there right now. Mr. Sir, are you there? I think slide has been seen in the later side. Uh, yeah, Rohit? Dr. Sharma, I'm there here. And uh, no, as uh, Madam has, Madam Bhamati has pointed out, yes. the last few slides. Uh, have not come actually. So you can forward the, and backward this. Uh, the uh, organizational change, change of ownership, outsourcing, and reduction of internal capacities. 
these uh, this was the last slide okay. beyond this no slide was uh, visible so you please uh, anyway we will uh, transmit those okay, slides okay. we will okay, upload I'm... the lecture yes, yes. to all okay, so okay. Uh, okay. thank you very much dr kunal it was really very very you, informative sir. very detailed and uh, uh, of course now there is not much time left so yeah. any questions are there please do write to us in the form of email or otherwise and uh, dr kodal will pro try to Definitely. provide the answers yeah, by yeah. the next class okay thank you okay uh, it, it was really quite informative thank you just uh, for my small information uh, that what is the difference between lc50 and ld50 ld50 and lc50 sir uh, as i have already quoted in case of ld50 what we do on, on a very simple note we will take a chemical which is toxic and uh, we will give that particular chemical to say 100 of rats and we will for after four hours we will ascertain that how many cats uh, died after consuming that particular chemical so we generally test for the 50 percent population rate if the 50 percent of rats say for example in 100 50 rats got killed after taking consuming that chemical then we say that ld50 of this particular chemical is this we ascertain in this type of time this chemical will cause death to 50 percent of test population Concentration is that we, 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 in the ambient atmosphere, we provide the chemical and then we will go and check the, uh, the test the, the, this thing, yeah, how many uh, test animals are uh, being dead due to these chemicals. This is LC50. If the chemicals are, uh, say, 30% people died, uh, percent died, then we quote it, it as LC30. And if 70, then we quote it as LC70. So what then, what is LC50? LD50, Concentration, okay, sir. Okay, that is the dose. So LC50, yeah. what is the difference between the two? LC50, LD50. Concentration and sir, dose. Dose means how much it is consuming. Yeah. By okay. how much? See, in, in concentration, you cannot ascertain how much. But yes, on the test material, for example, we have given 100 ppm of concentration. Yeah. Or say 1000. The procedure is diffusion. After a few times, what happened in the concentration will try to normalize. In that okay. concentration, how many sustain is the LC50? Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you so much. So, okay, okay, sir. we'll come to the con uh, conclusion and finally. So, thank you. Let us thank Dr. Kunal and uh, we'll now, meet again on uh, Friday at 3 o'clock. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody.